words from the 11th chapter of the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, verses 23 to 26. Paul writes, For I have received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. May God's blessing be on the reading and hearing of our scriptures this night. Shall we pray? O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts find acceptance in your sight. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. It's a great story in Exodus, is it not? And by story, I don't mean that it's untrue or that it's made up. By great, here I mean meaningful. A meaningful recounting if you will, of our religious history and heritage. It's kind of like the Christmas story. I mean, this is another one that we hear year after year after year, and yet it remains moving and compelling. The story of God at work to free people of old and how each generation up to and including ours is called upon to keep that story and its meaning alive and at work in the world. And like the Christmas story, though it's familiar to many of us, we tell it anew every year anyway. The people Israel held captive in Egypt, Moses' pleading had made no difference. The people were not freed. A number of plagues had come and gone. The people were not freed. Pharaoh had made a number of promises and broken every one. The people still were not freed. And so God to the Egyptian Pharaoh says, in essence, it's time I really got your attention. So God speaks next to the Israelites, and we heard Bruce tell the story, kill the lamb, put the blood on the doorpost, I'm coming through the land of Egypt tonight, to execute judgment. I will kill the firstborn in every house, except those with blood on the doorpost. I will pass over them. And then there's an elaborate ritual, and we didn't even read the whole thing tonight, elaborate ritual about how to slaughter the lamb and prepare it and to serve it and to eat it. And at the end of it all is the admonition, be ready to move, to leave at a moment's notice. Pharaoh likely is going to release you after what happens tonight, but he may change his mind, so you go when the going's good. Well, we know from later in the story that we did not read this evening that this is exactly what happened. There was great wailing and lamentation in Egypt. Even Pharaoh's house was affected by the killing, the death of the firstborn. Pharaoh released the Israelites. They left as God had promised. Yes, I know that Pharaoh changed his mind later on and, and, and followed after them and so forth, but that's another story. The fact is that in Exodus, the killing of the lamb, the blood on the doorpost worked. Freedom resulted that night. Now, There are a number of questions with this story. Some would would even use the word problems. Uh, Chief among them, if you think about it, for example, if, if God is God, wouldn't God know who was an Israelite and who was an Egyptian? Why would we, why would the Israelites have to kill lambs and put, put the blood on the doorpost? Since God, as we profess, is all powerful and all knowing, it seems that God could just kill the firstborn of the Egyptians without having anyone having to say, oh, no, over there, not here. And why kill animals? 
the firstborn, you know, of, of the animals. I mean, they had no part in the Israelite servitude and so on and so forth, you know. Good questions, I suppose, but the point is that whatever happened, however it happened, the Israelites gained their freedom in a dramatic way, and they were convinced that it was because of God and God's actions that they were released. It was important then that their descendants would always, always, always remember always remember, would celebrate that night, and it's, it's not stated, but it, it's clearly implied, would live better and differently because of it. So we have verse 14. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. Perpetual. That's a long time, perpetual. And so it was a couple of years later. Jesus is with his disciples in that small upper room, if you will, celebrating this festival that Exodus is talking about. They're, they were observing this perpetual ordinance, as we will shortly. The bread, the body, the wine or juice, you know, the blood. The Christians linked Jesus directly to that sacrificial Passover lamb. Jesus died, they said, so we could be freed, remain free, if you will. The Passover lambs were sacrificed for freedom. Jesus was a sacrifice for freedom. Now, as in the Exodus story, there are a lot of questions being raised among theologians today. Uh, about this theory and about this understanding. Uh, many people are asking, for example, well, why would God, a loving God, require someone to die so that others might live? It doesn't sound like something a loving God would do. I, I know in war, soldiers sacrifice themselves for a cause, for their comrades in arms. Law enforcement personnel sadly lose their lives in service to us. Parents sacrifice for children and so on and so forth. But these are very different from the notion that a good, loving, and a just God would require a rather arbitrary sacrifice. Well, this is a new conversation within the last decade or so, and, and so there's no real agreement yet on how to resolve this paradox, and I certainly don't have an answer, except to note that if Jesus hadn't died, there would have been no resurrection. Without a resurrection, there would have been no proof that Jesus was indeed the Savior sent from God. Now, again, we're not going to resolve that issue tonight. For us on this night, it's enough to know, it's all we need to know, that somehow, in some way, at some point in time, Jesus was abandoned, left alone to face death alone. And when we retell that story of Jesus last night with his disciples, as they kept their remembrance and ordinance, when we come together in the sacrament of communion and we keep that remembrance and ordinance, it links us to Jesus. It helps us to remember Jesus' sacrifice in whatever way and for whatever reason. It brings us together in Jesus and as the body of Christ, alive and at work in the world. And it does so because part of the power of Maundy Thursday is we know this night is not the end of the story. We know to come back in three days. And on that day, we won't come with a time of, rejoice, of mourning and loss, but rather with one of rejoicing and reclaiming. But still, we pause tonight and we celebrate this festival with the basic elements of the earth. The bread, the fruit of the vine. We remember. We remember the Israelites captive in Egypt. We remember Jesus 
disciples, in many ways captives under Rome. We remember and we give thanks. We go out in solemn thoughts. We go out thinking about what was and what is the role of sacrifice in our lives today. It's a quiet time, it's a pensive time, a thoughtful time, a time of introspection and self-examination done soberly and with humility. We commune and then we go forth to live and to serve until we come together again on the third day, then to celebrate and to rejoice and to go forth again to witness and to serve in new and in re-energized ways. Shall we pray? There is much for us to remember this night, O oh God. From many thousands of years ago, our Israelite forebears, to 2,000 years ago with Jesus and the disciples. And even to remember this day, why we are here and the call that you have given to us. We pray that we will remember and that we will keep this as a perpetual ordinance. That we shall always remember and live differently and better because of it. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.